At the back of the room, there are still some invitation cards to Christmas. Christmas comes every year. Every year it comes on the 24th and 25th of December, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. It's an annual thing. Did you know that? And because it's an annual thing, people always are, are looking for an opportunity to sort of connect with it. Uh, but it's hard to connect with Christmas if you don't believe in Jesus. Did you know that? Uh, the world desperately tries to connect with Christmas. They desperately, desperately, desperately want the gifts and the, and the stockings and the Santas and the Polar Expresses to somehow kind of fill that, that sort of, uh, fill that void at the heart of the, of the holiday, but they, but they can't. And so you would be amazed how many people are looking for an invitation to come and actually worship at Christmas. People who don't normally think of God or don't really have much of a, of a, an, a, a predisposition towards the things of the Lord will actually find themselves at Christmas much more open than you would ever realize. Probably more open to receiving an invitation than you are to giving one. Yeah, There's one for you to think about and pray about a little bit. Um, I was reading some, I got sent a, an article this week. It said that actually only 32 people out of every thousand in this nation goes to church regularly. And that's half what it was 20 years ago. That's significant. The, the, the church attending population of the United States of America is, uh, is half what it was 20 years ago. That, that is, that is, that's the reality. It's this, this stark reality of the accelerating lostness all around us. And yet people are, are very, very spiritual. I think it's a, there's just a disillusionment and a cynicism that's kind of crept into our souls. And we don't even realize it. 968 people out of every thousand um, are not reaching out or connecting with, with Jesus this Christmas in a meaningful way. Uh, but what they are doing is what the rest of us are doing. They're piling up the credit card debt. They're, um, <laughs> they're filling up their, their grocery carts. They're loading up at the ABC store. They're binge watching Netflix. And the, the problem is, is that we're, we as a society, as a culture, we're all drowning. We know these things don't work. We know these things aren't really kind of filling us deep within our soul, but we're, we're desperate. I think you, uh, it was a Bono from U2 tw uh, in one of their, their songs years ago talked about, Jesus, won't you take the time to throw a drowning man a line? It's one of their Christmas songs talking about how there really isn't peace on earth. And uh, deep down, people, people don't believe that God really can be bothered with them. It's not that people don't believe that God exists. But, I mean, I think our understanding of medical, of the way the, way the human body is crafted, the way the world works, our, our understanding of biology and, and nanobiology and what's going on at the micro... The, uh, listen, there aren't really any atheists left. Did you realize that? You, you actually can't have a brain and be an atheist. You can't. It is impossible for what we live. This, this circling globe spinning through the universe at the perfect speed, at the perfect ratio, at the perfect... With, with, and life just happens. The way, I mean, no one who's really actually spent any serious time looking into this can actually come up with the conclusion that there is no spiritual reality out there. It's just we don't really like the answer that the Bible gives us. We, we, we know there's a God, we just don't really like him, or we don't believe he's, he's invested in our lives, or he cares about our lives. And so Christmas is an opportunity for you to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to literally throw a line to people, a lifeline, to take the time to notice them, to invite them in. Because the only place they'll find true rest for their souls is in the family of God. And, and the world will tell you that the church is the problem. Do you, do you, yeah, if you turn on the news... Every, every week there's an article about how Christians are the problem. Christians are the source of all the problems of the world. I mean, I read it all the time. I get sent these articles all the time. And, and it's not true. <laughs> it's just not the truth. Uh, so what people do is they try and hollow out the season. They try to remove all references to the baby, to the manger, to the shepherds, to the star. I mean, when I first came to America, I was shocked. And I say this as an Englishman. 
I come from pagan England, as you've heard me say many times. And yet, I, I came to America. I went to a, an elementary school Christmas, uh, Christmas, well, no, holiday, sorry, holiday production. And there were frost, there were snowmen, and there were winter songs, and there were songs about um, the Polar Express, and, and there was not a single mention of a baby or shepherd or a manger. Back where I come from, you have an elementary Christmas production, it's Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, and the stars. So why is America so different? It's because we've worked really, really hard to take, to disconnect uh, Jesus from uh, the Christmas season because we've, we, we've somehow bought into the lie that, that actually the, that the church is the problem. The, the truth is, is that the church is God's solution to the problem, which is the emptiness of our souls, the bankruptcy of our souls. Uh, the, the, world, the world doesn't believe. He be, it knows that God exists. It just doesn't believe he cares about them. And this Christmas, we can challenge that notion. We can actually give people an opportunity to realize that not only does God care about them, but we care about them. That the message that we speak at Christmas dismantles the lie. It echoes through the generations that God is indifferent to your suffering. He doesn't care about your journey. He's not interested in your story, and he's not able to do anything about it. And that's the greatest lie ever told. Because you open the pages of Luke chapter 2, and you'll realize that God cares intimately. He cares intimately about people's lives, and he cares intimately about the details of their lives. And so I'm going to begin reading from Luke chapter 2 today. Turn with me in your Bibles. Many of you are familiar these are possibly the most familiar words in the Bible. Uh, they ought to be familiar to many of you. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time, for her to give birth, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased and the angels went away from from them into heaven the shepherds said to one another let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us in those days we, we, you know when, when we we hear these words a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. We get filled with all these goosebumps and good feelings, don't we? Because we find ourselves back in that scene with Linus, Charlie Brown. And we have good feelings about that. We think hot chocolate and gingerbread men and presents under the tree and a roaring fire and chestnuts. You know, all those good images and feelings and thoughts that we associate with the Christmases of long, long, long ago. Not, not the more recent Christmases where we're fighting with, with each other and with our kids and with our families and all this kind of stuff. But the, the Christmases are like four and five years old. We have these good memories. We read this passage of Scripture, and it fills us with just comfort and peace, doesn't it? In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all the world should be registered. Think about it for a minute. You've uh, the disruption and the inconvenience. There's a census. And each one of you has to go back to the courthouse in the town which is written on your birth certificate so that the IRS can double the amount of income tax you're paying next year. That's what's going on here. 
Uh, I know that some of you are thinking, you're thinking, well, we've got the Second Amendment. No, no, but, but the Jewish people didn't have that. They have no rights at all. You see, this decree goes out from the occupying Roman power that you're going to go back to the town of your ancestral birth so we can charge you money that you don't have. So you can pay more. These are the, the Jewish people in the days of Jesus are the most taxed people on the face of the earth. They're paying, we, we don't know exactly in, in this period, but we know about 60 years later, we know that their effective rate of, of taxation from the Roman government is about 60 to 70%. Everything they had. Can you imagine? No, you can't imagine. We actually live, for all our complaining, we actually live in a tremendously free world uh, compared to what they lived in. They were taxed when they used the road. They were taxed when they lived in a home. They were taxed when they fished fish. They were taxed when they went to the next town. They were taxed when they bought something. They were taxed when they sold something. They were, they, they were pretty much taxed whatever they did. And so the, 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 the problem is, is that Mary and Joseph, this young couple that finds themselves unexpectedly pregnant out of wedlock, uh, rejected by their family, kind of ostracized by their community, finds themselves with no choice than to make this long, arduous, difficult journey down the spine of the mountainous spine of the, the land of Israel from Nazareth in the north down to Bethlehem just south of Jerusalem. is a, a little over 100 miles, and it's not 100 miles straight. Straight. It is up and down and up and down. So up some very, very steep mountain ridges and across some very um, uh, treacherous valley mountain passes through the, the, the route, what's known as the route of the patriarchs, most likely, down through Samaria. And, and so there's, there's, a, there's disruption, there's lost income, there's exploitation. And one of the things I want us to realize as we go to this, this story is how sometimes the most beautiful things come out of the toughest of circumstances. There's nothing fun. There's nothing wonderful. There's nothing that feels good about the circumstances of Luke chapter 2. Certainly not for the people within the story. Fear not, the angel says to the shepherds. Behold, <laughs> look, I, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. It's funny how we have to turn our attention to that. Behold, I bring you good news. Well, well, I didn't think it was good news. I thought that my life was falling apart. I thought the circumstances of our social and economic and political and national situation were completely beyond repair. And yet the angels break through the sky. Fear not, behold. Good news of great joy. You see... Most of us in these circumstances of Luke chapter 2, whether we were the shepherds, whether we were Mary, whether we were Joseph, whether we were any of the players in the story, we would have thought that this was not very good news and it certainly wasn't going to impact anybody else. Uh, the governor, uh, were Quirinus, issues a decree that Caesar Augustus has declared everybody should be registered and taxed. And so the invitation for us is to look beyond these and to see that in the midst of our season, in the midst of our stories of our lives, our situations, that we, we get to look, behold him and realize that there is good news of great joy of what God is doing. Not what man is doing, not what the government is doing, not what the Caesar in Rome is doing, not what the circumstances of our lives are producing for us, but there is good news of great joy because God is doing something. And what God is doing is far more magnificent and beautiful than anything that the people of earth could find themselves doing. God is doing this magnificent work of redemption in your life, and he's doing it in my life. And there may be no room at the inn. There may be no midwife. There may be no money. And there may be no family. But God is on the move. God is at work in this story. When the fullness of time had come, Paul says in Galatians 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law at the perfect time. The perfect time. God picked the perfect time in human history. He picked the perfect people. He picked the perfect place. And what's incredible to us is it doesn't really look like that from the pages of this Bible. How true is that of my life and your life? It looks sometimes like God's missed the time in my life, or he's missed the place, or he's missed the people. 
that God doesn't seem to know what he's doing with the broken pieces of my life. He's, you know, he says that he's got a plan. He can work all things together for good, for the, for the good of those who love him. But do we really believe it? Do we really believe that God is good, that he is able, that he is sovereign, that he's working? And that's the great challenge of the Christmas story. Do we, do we recognize the, the incredible power and majesty of God's plan? Or do we just think it's a bunch of random coincidences all thrown together? God isn't just papering over the cracks in this redemption story. He's not just urging humanity to self-improvement. He, he's, he's taking all these pieces of the Old Testament prophets and the brokenness of the sinfulness of humanity, and he's doing something new. It's what we spoke about a few weeks ago. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing something that you've ne- has never been done before. I'm breaking through the darkness with my light. I'm penetrating the lies with my word. I'm bringing to birth something in planet Earth that will change everything for everyone for all time. Behold good news of great joy that will be for all people. And so uh, we, we, we enter this story and we realize that God isn't just in the business. When it says that the, the, the perfect time Jesus was born, brought forth from woman to redeem those under the law, we, we don't understand what that word redemption means. Redemption doesn't just mean that, that, that God makes old things Uh, better again. He doesn't just put us back together again the way we were. He takes the old and the broken, and he makes something new and beautiful, even in the midst of the brokenness. This is the gospel of the kingdom, is that God takes my weakness and my brokenness, and he makes something beautiful out of it. He takes takes our wounds, and in those scars, he, he, he inscribes his love for us. And there's a wonderful truth in this. We see even after the resurrection, Jesus is crucified and buried in the tomb. And on the third day, he rises again with a resurrected body that is perfect, that is radiant, that is filled with life and filled with light. And yet he still wears the scars of the nail prints in his hands. Why? Because there's beauty in those scars. I was reading a book a little while ago, um, a few weeks ago, and it was talking about the Japanese art of kintsugi. I didn't really know this was a thing. I don't know much about much. but um, So I learned about this, and I was like, well, this is quite interesting. It's an ancient Japanese art form. And what they would do is they would take old ceramic pots, pots that in and of themselves have little or no value. And then these ceramic pots would be broken. So once they're broken into sort of 100 different pieces, they, what didn't have much value has absolutely no value. All throughout human history, actually, broken pottery is the, it's the way you, you, you date the archaeological layers in any dig anywhere in the world because pottery has been around forever. And the way the age of the pottery tells us, it tells us what, we're, what we're looking at, the coins next to it or whatever else we're finding. And so this ancient Japanese art, Kintsugi, what they would do is they would take these broken uh, pieces of, of, of pottery and they would repair them with liquid gold. And we, I've got a picture of it. This, this priceless gold, this, this matchless craftsmanship takes the broken thing and in every crack. There is, so that this piece is, is priceless. It's unique. It can never be replicated. These broken pieces that have no value uh, are in the, in the master's hand, in the, in the craftsman's hand, are produced into something completely unique. That the, In a sense, the wounds of the cracked pottery become the scars of the, of the gleaming gold of the master's touch. And so we see this. This is what redemption means. This is what the Christmas story is about. He's not just coming back down and saying, okay, we're going to have a do-over. We're going to take you all back to Eden, and we're going to pretend that the Adam and Eve thing never happened. No, he's not doing that. I wish he would do that. Have you ever tried to do that? Like, can I just go back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, two minutes? Can I just go back and pretend that that thing I said or that thing I did just never happened? 
like it was, we could be as we were. But we can't do that. That's the problem of the human condition. We can't go back there. We can't go back to Eden. We can't go back to a place where we are sinless, where, we, where, where we're unsoiled or unscarred by the, by the struggles and by the sinfulness and by the brokenness of our humanity. We can't go back there. But what we can do is we can take the broken pieces of our lives and we can yield them to the master potter. And he can repair and he can restore to make something far more beautiful than had we never been broken in the first place. And this is what's going on in the Christmas story. His timing is impeccable. His purposes are are absolutely unshakable. He's working he was working then, he's working now. He's the same God now and forever. And, and, and the invitation for us is to put ourselves in the minds and put ourselves in the shoes of the people living this Christmas story and realize that they had the same challenge. They had the same um, struggle that we have, that they were sometimes taking one foot in front of another and they couldn't see the stars in the sky and they couldn't understand his purposes and they had to trust him. And when the angel says, this is good news, of great joy for all people far and near. They had to choose to believe that it was true. And see, I'm here proclaiming to you this Christmas that God has good news for you of great joy that will be for you and all the people that God wants to do something new in your heart and in your life. God wants to redeem you. He wants to repair you. He wants to do something so beautiful out of the dust and the ashes and the broken pieces of your life. And I have evidence for that assertion. And the evidence is the Christmas story because it is truly the most beautiful, most beautiful of stories that we could ever imagine in the same region. There were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Bethlehem, the, the, Bethlehem, the, the ancient town of David, just to the south of Jerusalem, about five to seven miles from Jerusalem, over the, the steep Gilo Ridge down a little bit. It's, a, it's just slightly to the... Um, slightly to the east and slightly to the south, and yet there's a funny topographical reality. Bethlehem's almost like in a bit of a bowl, and the way the rain falls upon that region, it it, it falls on the one side of the mountains, and on the other side is is desert. And the funny thing is, is that there's a little bit more rainfall just south of Jerusalem in Bethlehem and to the west of Jerusalem than there is in the eastern parts of Jerusalem into the desert. And what it does is it means there's a little bit more fertility. There's a little bit more greenery. There's a little bit more pasture land in Bethlehem. And, and the way the tobacco, I mean, I'm not talking about lush green rolling fields like we think of pasture land, but in the Middle Eastern terms, this is good pasture land. And the topography allows with the terraced hills of the, the agriculture and the, the, the little town of Bethlehem nestled in the shadow of the Gilo Ridge. There, there's this, this incredible place where you can raise huge, vast numbers of flocks of sheep in that particular terrain, in that particular part of the world. In fact, Bethlehem was the center of, a, of an industrial level farming operation where the lambs that were being prepared for the Passover sacrifice were flocked and were, were bred and were cared for and were watched over by the, a class of shepherds that actually were employed by the priests of the temple. They actually worked in service of the temple. Why? Because every year at Passover, they would need tens of thousands of pure one-year-old spot certified lambs to be sacrificed on the temple to atone for the sins of the people. And where would those lambs come from? Well, they came from the little town of Bethlehem in the fields outside of Bethlehem where shepherds were watching in the same region their flocks by night. And the job of these shepherds was to care for, to watch over, and to certify the birth of the lambs because only a spotless lamb, only a lamb that isn't injured in the birthing process without a broken bone and and without a spot or blemish could be considered a worthy sacrifice to atone for the sins of the people, that the Lord's wrath would pass over his people at Passover one more year. So the context of Jesus' birth is not accidental. 
the, the, the pressing social political circumstances, the, the sudden pregnancy uh, on, on Mary, the rejection of her family, the census, the journey, no money, no room at the inn, the, the rage even of King Herod, which we read about in Matthew chapter 2, and then fleeing out to Egypt. The, 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 there's, this, there's this incredible circumstance of the story that made very, very difficult read, living for the characters involved but wonderful reading for us because it is an incredible story of the faithfulness of God, of his faithfulness amidst the brokenness and amidst the struggle, amidst the circumstances. He is faithful to his people. And Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, he knew this story. After all, he had his own miraculous birth story. We spoke about it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he was born to Zechariah the priest, uh, the old faithful priest who the angel appears to while he's ministering at the altars of incense. If you don't know the story, read it. It's in Luke chapter 1. Uh, and he, 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 uh, the, the angel appears to Zechariah says, you're going to have a son and he's going to prepare the way. He's going to be a forerunner for the one who's come to deliver uh, your people. And Elizabeth, he says, how can that happen? Because Elizabeth, my wife, is old and she's barren. And the angel says, I stand in the presence of God and I've said that he's going to do it and he's going to do it. And so there's this incredible intervention of God in the affairs of man. And John the Baptist, the baby that is born to these aged parents, must have heard the story. No doubt he'd heard talk from his mother as a young child of her dear cousin Mary giving birth out of wedlock in the shepherd's fields outside of Bethlehem. But even he admits later in his life, John the Baptist, in the the height of his ministry, even he admits he didn't know what all this meant. And he wasn't even sure that this Jesus, that, that, that the family had spoken about, that was born in the fields, that was attended by shepherds and was visited by wise men, that fled to Egypt for fear of the wrath of a tyrannical king. He wasn't even sure that this Jesus was really the one. Several times in the Gospels, we, we once in, in John chapter 1 and once a little bit later, we, we, we see John the Baptist questioning, Jesus, are you really for real? Are you really the one? I know your story. I know, you were, I know that the angel spoke of your birth just as it spoke of mine, but are you really the one? But there's these moments of incredible prophetic clarity that come upon him. And the first of these we read in John chapter 1, when he's baptizing by the Jordan River. This is 30 plus years later. He's baptizing by the Jordan River. He's calling the nation to repentance. He's this incredible, powerful prophet that is, is getting the attention of the authorities and all the people. And the next day, uh, Jesus comes to him, and Jesus says, I need to be baptized by you. And he says, Jesus, I know a little bit about you, and I think you might be the one, and I'm not sure you need to be baptized by me. And Jesus says, no, I do. I need to fulfill all righteousness. And, And so John baptizes him, and as he does, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. And the Lord had already spoken to John. He says, when you see the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descend upon someone you're baptizing, you will know that this is the one. And then in the very next day, uh, he sees Jesus coming towards him uh, in the same area by Bethany, by the Jordan. And he says these words, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world. This is he, he says, of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. You see, John's recognition that this is he. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the perfect Passover sacrifice. He's gentle. He's lowly. He's without spot or blemish, yet he's the one lifted up. He's the one who precedes me. It's a really interesting comment that John makes because he's older than Jesus. Have you been around brothers or cousins? Like, you, you, you might, I've got a cousin. He's like four months older than me. But I tell you what, we may be approaching sort of the latter stages of our lives, but that four months really matters. If you've got brothers, you know, it really matters. I'm a year older than you, and I'm and I'm gonna pull rank on you for the rest of my life. It's really interesting. John's saying something here. He's saying, he's saying that that even though I'm the older child, he precedes me. 
he's greater than me because he was before me. These are astonishing comments that, that John says. How could he be so sure? How could he be so sure of the purpose of Jesus? Because in that moment by the banks of the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus and something in his heart is unlocked and he sees it. All the stories he's heard as a child, all the things that, that he's read in the scriptures, they all come together in one moment. Behold the Lamb of God. And that's what I want to unpack for you here today. What was it that came together in that moment? What was it that John recognized? What was it that John saw? You see, John saw a lamb, and in that lamb, he saw a sacrifice. And in that sacrifice, he saw the culmination of God's perfect plan to redeem mankind. The shepherds saw something too. They saw a baby in a manger. They saw a savior. But the authorities of Jesus' day, they saw something different. Uh, they, they saw a threat. They saw a problem. In fact, even King Herod, when you may know the better of the Christmas story, we don't like to tell our children. When King Herod, King Herod, I always, it always amazes me that song. I don't understand it. Can, you, can I, I, I didn't grow up listening to this song. Um, do, you, do you see what I see or whatever that song is? Did you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? Is that how it goes? You know, the king on a hill saying, I mean, in this story, you've got a king on a hill who's like a good guy who's inviting people to, to worship the baby in the manger. And you're like, that's not what I read in Matthew chapter 2. <laughs> the king on the hill wanted to kill the baby. And the king, on the, hill, the king on the hill sent an army of soldiers into Bethlehem to kill all the babies and slaughter them. That's the bit of the Christmas story we don't like to tell. You see, the Christmas story is quite hard. There's some pieces of it that are quite hard. That, 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 that Jesus' birth is surrounded by conflict and trouble and difficult circumstances. And we feel, we, we, we think of it in terms of the fire and the, the chestnuts and the, and the, and the hot chocolate and, and the gingerbread men. But actually, it, the reality of the Christmas story is, is, is it's quite stark. It's quite difficult. The circumstances are troubling. You see, the, the threat of execution was never far from Jesus. Uh, he spoke, uh, even when he's dedicated as a tiny baby in the temp temple, we read about it at the end of Luke chapter 2, uh, the great, the righteous Simeon uh, pro prophesies over him. He says, he, he blesses Mary and Jesus, and he says, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many. He will be a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce your soul also, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. It's an incredible uh, incredible prophecy. He's saying that there, the sword will never be far from Jesus. The threat against his life will never diminish. That there will be pain and there will be suffering that is deeply inter interconnected with the calling upon his life. And that suffering, Mary, will afflict you too. And so the, the, the sword of King Herod may have missed the baby Jesus in Bethlehem when he was born because they fled to Egypt. But that sword was, Damoclean's sword was hanging over his whole life, if you like. The height of his ministry, the, the religious authorities, the Jewish authorities threatened by his popularity, conspired to hand him over to be executed by the Romans to secure their own place and their own position. You see, John saw a lamb, but they saw a scapegoat. They saw, they saw one who could be used to prop up their position and secure, carry favor with the Roman authorities. Uh, the chief priests, it says in John chapter 11, I put it in your notes, uh, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered in the council and said, what are we going to do? For this man performs so many signs, if we let him go on like this, everybody will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should not perish. You see, Caiaphas, the high priest, makes this incredible declaration. It's better for you that he die. John says he's the Lamb of God, and the high priest says it's better for all of us if this one dies. And he had the authority to certify the Lamb. He had the authority to commission the scapegoat. He had the authority to declare the sacrifice appropriate on behalf of the nation, and not just for the nation, but for the whole world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin 
of the world. See, the precision with which God allowed his purposes to be fulfilled, the precision with which God did not allow anything to fall to chance, all the choices, all the decisions, all the circumstances of men can collide together in the perfect fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. Why? Because he's, he's fusing gold in the crack. And he's putting something beautiful together that we could never have imagined. Or we would never believe, even if it were told to us, that the God of history knows the beginning and the end. And he knows how to redeem those who put their trust in him. And the God that's able to do this in the pages of these scriptures is able to do it in your life. And he's able to do it in my life. He's able to be trusted with the broken pieces. And he's able to fuse them into something of inestimable value and beauty. If only we will trust the pieces of our lives to him. Uh, how could the religious leaders of Jesus' day look upon him? Hear Jesus' words and not truly behold him. How could they not comprehend him? John, again in John chapter 1, he says, he, he, he says it this way. He says, he was in the world, speaking of Jesus. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. You see, he, he came to his people, but his, and his people had no excuse, but his people were blinded as to who he was. They had the scriptures. Scriptures that spoke so powerfully and irrefutably about who he was and why he had come, but they were so blinded to the truth of Scripture, just as we are. You see, we don't believe God's working in our circumstances. We, we don't know him. We don't really receive what he has to say. We don't behold him. You see, we, we're so busy taking the, 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 the rubble of our lives and saying, God, what have you done? God, what have you done? That we're not willing to behold what he's doing. The redemptive power of God, if only we'd let him work through the brokenness, work through the, through the, through, through the circumstances, work through our fallenness. You see, the invitation of Christmas, it keeps coming to us. Behold him. John saw a lamb. He'll take away your sin. He'll deal with it once and for all at the cross. Caiaphas saw a scapegoat, the one who could take away the guilt and the shame from the nation. It's better for you that he die and you get to live. But back in the ancient Old Testament scriptures, the prophets, they saw more than just a lamb. They saw more than just a scapegoat. They saw the plan. They saw it, it was veiled, it was, it was not clear to them fully how it would work out, but the plan of God is prescribed, it's laid out. He was, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is dim, it says in Isaiah, as uh, uh, dumb, it says in Isaiah 53, he opened not his mouth. Uh, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've each led to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What, what Caiaphas is doing is fulfilling the Scripture. What John is doing is recognizing the truth of the Scripture. God has been working from the very beginning, and God continues to work. And a God that, that works century after century after century after century to perfect, perfect his plan is able to perfect his plan in your life. Do you believe that? This Christmas, Micah uh, saw this plan. We, we read about it in Micah chapter 5. It's at the end of the Old Testament, one of the great Old Testament prophets, Micah. And the reason why we speak of Micah when it comes to the Christmas story is in Matthew's gospel. When the wise men come to Jerusalem, and they say, where is the one to be born who's king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we followed it. Uh, they, they get led into the palace of Herod. And Herod turns to the scribes and the wise men. He says, well, where is the king of the Jews going to be born? And they're like, well, Micah says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's how they know where to look. It says this in verse 2 of Micah chapter 5, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. And it says he shall stand, verse 4, and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be 
their peace. I don't know about you, but you may have been to church your whole life and heard about a lamb who takes away the sins of the world, or, or maybe you've heard about the substitutionary atonement that Jesus, Jesus paid the price on the cross for your sin and mine, and it's better for us that he died than, than we live continually in the, with the weight of our sin, what Jesus would accomplish on the cross. But I wonder, have you really ever grasped the, the beauty of the plan? The precision of the plan of God. His, the one who's coming forth is of old. Everything we see happening in Luke chapter 2, everything we see happening in those shepherd's fields has been foretold, has been prophesied time after time after time after time. The, the precision with which the Old Testament prophets find, uh, find their, their words fulfilled literally and specifically in the life of Jesus is so mind-boggling amazingly amazing that the plan of God will not be thwarted. God is able to be trusted across the centuries and God is able to be trusted across the days of your life. Do you believe that? This God who can weave it all together can hold your life together. That God can be trusted with your past, your present, and your future. You see, God doesn't make mistakes he, he, when he formed you in your mother's womb, it says in, in Psalm 139, he saw all your days when they were as yet unformed. He, he, he's the one who counts the hairs on your head, and he knows the thoughts in your heart before you even utter them or speak them. He knows you. He knows you're rising. He knows you're sleeping. He knows you're coming in and you're going out, and his coming forth has been prophes prophesied of old. He is the ancient of days, and his magnificent, eternal, ancient work of redemption stretches through time. It stretches through your past into your present, and it will lead you into your future. And we read about it hundreds of years before it even happens in the scriptures, and these scriptures can be trusted. The scriptures that could be trusted in the days of Jesus can be trusted with your life today. And so we, we turn back the page of Micah chapter 5 to Micah chapter 4. And as, as I get ready to close, I want, I want you to, to just, just, just dwell on the imagery of the prophet here. It says, it, it speaks about in that day, the Lord's going to gather back his people those who are cast off, those who have been driven away. That there's going to be a, a coming kingdom where he, like the good shepherd, will gather his lost and scattered sheep. And then it says, And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it shall come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Why do you cry aloud that there's no king in you? Has your counselor perished? The pain that seized you like a woman in labor, writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hands of your enemies. See, the prophecies surrounding the birth of Jesus, that he'll be born in Bethlehem, that he'll be, his coming will be from old, that he'll rise and shepherd his people, are accompanied by another prophecy, that there will be one who is grabbed with the pains of childbirth in the open field outside of Bethlehem. See, we love to think about him being, him being, him being the righteous coming king, but spare a thought for little Mary, 14, 15 years old, stumbling over that Gila Ridge eight and a half months pregnant with her young fiancé Joseph, uh, in some ways, they're exiles from, from Judah. They've been disconnected from their ancestral home, maybe because of family circumstances, maybe because of economic realities. They, they've grown up in, the, in the, the nether regions of the north, and here they are. They've been cast off. They've been driven away, and they're coming back into the center of their ancestral homelands, but they are, they are with child, but they are not married. They've been rejected by their family. They don't have a penny to their name. And pain is seizing this young girl as she climbs the Gila Ridge like a, a woman in labor, approaching the region of Ephrathah. 
And Mary knows what all good Jewish people know, that her great-great ancestor, Rachel, died in those same shepherd's fields, giving birth to Benjamin. That the weeping over Bethlehem that Jeremiah prophesies, Rachel weeping for her children, is intimately connected to a young woman crossing that ridge, eight and a half months pregnant, and giving birth and dying in the field. And here's Mary beginning to feel the contractions. And there's no room in the inn. And the only place she's got to go is in the open field. Do you ever think that God's forgotten your situation or lost your address? See, all Mary did was say yes to Jesus. Say yes to being the mother of the Savior of the world. Said yes to the angel. Said yes to the purpose of God. And now the purpose of God has led her into an impossible place with no way out, with no hand to hold with no money to her name. And, and the decree of Caesar Augustus was, was unbending. The steep round mountain road was unforgiving. The, the, the labor pains were unrelenting. And do you really think that the words of the angels made any sense to her in that moment? Behold, good news of great joy. She's, she's in the labor pains in the middle of a field giving birth. And for all she knows, her part in this story is to give birth and to die, just like her ancestor, Rachel. Perhaps the God that was able to promise her a son who would sit on the throne of his father, David, might be able to take care of a reservation at the inn. You ever thought about that? Have you ever started to question God's goodness? When you are a vehicle for the purpose of God, but the purpose of God doesn't make any sense to you. And you wonder whether he's competent to care for you. You wonder if he cares for you. Rise and groan, O daughter of Zion, it says in Micah chapter 4, like a woman in labor, for now you shall grow out from the city and dwell in the open country. And you, O tower of the flock, Hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it shall come. You see, out in the open countries of the fields outside of Bethlehem are what's called these towers of the flock. It's actually a thing. In Hebrew, it's the Migdal Eder. It's, it's actually a, it's a structure, an ancient structure. You see them all around these fields by Bethlehem. They're watchtowers. Why? Because all the shepherds would flock these massive flocks of sheep that they would use to raise the temple sacrifices. They'd build watchtowers so they could watch over large numbers of flocks. They could take care. They could spot the bears and the lions and the wild animals. And these, these watchtowers were built on the sides of the cliffs and normally built on top of caves or either one or two stories or sometimes just built on a cave. And, and at the top, they would watch and down below, they would lie down, maybe sleep. They would have feeding troughs for some of the animals. In Hebrew, it's called a migdal, a deer, the tower of the flock. In the New Testament, it's translated as a stable. And the purpose of these structures was to have a safe place to bring the lambs in so that when they gave birth to their lambs, these lambs would not be injured. These lambs would be cared for. These lambs could be wrapped in swaddling cloths. Do you know what swaddling cloths were? The Mishnah tells us what they were. The Jewish oral tradition tells us that, that these priest shepherds in the fields outside of Bethlehem would have the former priestly garments that would be worn by the priests as they ministered in the candles and the incense altars in the temple of God. And when those, those garments got too old to be used, they would be ripped up into cloths and they would be handed to the priest shepherds with which they would wrap the newborn lambs that would be prepared for the Passover sacrifice. And this will be a sign for you when you see a baby in place of a lamb. When you see a baby in one of these birthing rooms that are prepared for the lambs, being attended to by the priest shepherds, being, being wrapped in the swaddling cloths, that these holy garments that are used to preserve the perfect sacrifice. When you see these things, you'll know that a Savior has been born to you. 
Nothing was left to chance. The certification of the birth of the Lamb of God, the birth announcement of all birth announcements, the sky breaking open and the angelic choir singing, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace to men upon whom his favor rests. How do I know the favor of God rests upon you? Because he's not forgotten his purposes. Because his plans are perfect. And he is able to hold you. He is able to preserve you. And he is able to redeem you. Bethlehem, Ephrathah. From you shall come a ruler of Israel, the ancient of days, the one who will stand and shepherd his flock with the strength of the Lord. And he shall be your peace. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The one whose coming forth was prophesied from of old. The one who's able to reconfigure the broken shards of your life with gold. The one who came forth from the fields of Bethlehem in Ephrathah, from the smallest of the clans of Judah, the one called to be the ruler of Israel, the one uh, who's ancient of days, the one who precedes me, John said, the one who will shepherd me, John says, who will shepherd his flock, who will be our peace, the one that's been prophesied, the one that's been promised, not just the word made flesh, but the lamb of God, the shepherd of the flock, the prince of peace, and by his sinless birth and his perfect sacrifice. He's, he was offered up for you without spot or blemish at twilight on that Passover on a Roman cross. Who could have ever imagined a story like this? A story of such beauty. Good news of great joy. Will you behold it? Will you look about it? Because what happens when you look at the beauty of this story is you see the magnificence of God's power to make your story beautiful in the broken places, to weave the broken pieces together and make something of your life that is so much more valuable and so much more magnificent and so much more precious and so much more incredible than you could ever believe or you could ever conceive or you could ever imagine. Just think of Mary and Joseph. They had no idea we'd be talking about them thousands of years later. They had no idea what God was doing. And you don't either, but he's working his purposes out in your life. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me right now as we respond to this word. We don't, we're, we're running out of time. And I want us just to have a moment. In a moment, I'm just going to ask the worship team just to lead us in that chorus of the, the Lamb of God. And I want us to gaze upon him the perfect, sinless Lamb of God. We're so fixated with a baby in a manger, we forget the God in the heaven that is working all the time. Some of you may not have truly beheld Him and received Him. You may believe in Him in your head, but you've not received Him in your heart. There's going to be an opportunity in a moment for you to receive Him. There's going to be people at the altars who are going to come forward and you can pray with them. I, 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 I've heard about you, but I've never really believed that you are the one for me, that you're the one who can save me, that you're the Lamb of God who takes away my sin. If that's you, I want you to respond. Just come and pray with someone. And secondly, I don't want us just to behold the Lamb today. I want us to behold the plan See, God has a plan. And God is working out His plan in your life. And if like Mary and Joseph, you don't get it, you don't understand it, you don't like it, and you, you really feel a lot of fear about it, I want you to realize that He is a sovereign God and He can work through any circumstance and He can achieve the thing He's purposed for you this Christmas. If you're struggling with that in your life, to believe that God is able to take the broken pieces and make something beautiful of them. But, but you haven't seen the brokenness of my life. You, haven't, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. 
I want to encourage you, come forward, let someone pray and agree with you. Behold his purpose in your life. Good news of great joy for all people will be to you this Christmas because the Savior has come down. Behold him. Behold the Lamb of God. Lord, I just pray that these words would penetrate our hearts, Lord, that we would look upon you. Lord, the lowly and lifted one, the the perfect sacrifice, the ancient of days. You've been working from before time. You've been preparing us for this moment, Lord, that we might receive you as the one, the author of our story, the finisher of our faith, the one who's able to lead us through. Lord, encourage your people in this place today. Lord, as we lay hold of your purposes for our lives. In Jesus' name.